Over the last few months, we've been looking at the book of Acts. And I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed looking at the book of Acts. And, and we looked at it through the lens of being a church on the move. Of being a church that makes God smile. Wouldn't you like to be that way? Wouldn't you like to be uh, that classification? Mount Calvary, boy, it makes the Lord smile. As we've seen throughout our time, though, it takes people, you and me, who have surrendered everything at the foot of the cross and said, not my will, but yours be Lord. Yeah. And whatever you want is a me is yours. So if we're going to be a church on the move, then we've got to be a people on the move. And people on the move are surrendered people. Yeah. A surrendered people that say, Lord, here's the white flag to everything that matters. Not only to be a people in the mood, do we have to surrender everything, but we have to have our, our, our ears, our hearts, our minds trained on the wavelength of the Holy Spirit. I've shared with you often one of the things that frustrate me as I look at churches of all different shapes, sizes, denominations in Cleveland is that we're not impacting darkness. We're not impacting lostness. Amen. And at the end of the day, 92% of our city, if the Lord were to come back today, would not go with him up in the air. Amen. 92%. And, and, and yet I look around and I see so much activity. But is it focused? You see, people all throughout Cleveland are running to and fro. fro Holding on to everything, claiming everything, but Jesus. And that is nothing but an empty shell. Ever, ever been uh, at a tree when a bug uh, changes its, its, uh, uh, its shell and just empty there? I used to love to take those and chase my sisters with it. But there's nothing left of a bug there, is it? It's just an empty shell, and if you, if you even rub it a little bit, it crumbles in your hands. And our world today without Jesus is just an empty shell. There, there, there is nothing of substance, there's nothing of life in it but a shell. I believe that if we're going to change this trend in Cleveland and shine light on darkness and give direction to the lost then I believe that we must, and hear this, we must saturate and we must penetrate. Amen. We must saturate and penetrate to, to, to reach the lost, to impact darkness, to light a big torch in the middle of the darkness. It's not going to just take saying, okay, we're a church over here, come to us. It's not going to take building... And even if you raise a whole bunch of money and build a bigger sign, and that sign says, come to us. It's not going to be having the best music. It's not going to be about all these other things that are good in themselves. Amen. But more often than not, the people that need to be here are here, and the people that, that, that need to be here are out there. It involves taking Jesus. Listen to this. Taking Jesus where you are mm -hmm. and letting the gospel penetrate yes. your world, your school, your neighborhood, your family. Do you know what? That if we, when we scatter out today, you're going to scatter to different neighborhoods. You're going to scatter uh, during this week to different jobs. You're going to scatter to different places of, 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 of work and school and all kinds of different areas. That is your sphere. But as you, as you spread out, you need to take Jesus. Amen. I, I think more often than not, if we're not careful, we have relegated taking Jesus to a program. And you often go to places that are not your places, and you artificially go and talk to people that are not normally in your sphere, how much easier and better would it be if you said today, when I spread out and leave, and leave this church and go my way, I'm taking Jesus with me. Yes. Yes. 
And you've heard Dr. Davis read our passage, but I want you to have your Bibles open. And so if you, if you happen to close them, turn to Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. Amen. Now I'm going to read the scripture throughout the message, but I want you to hear this. I can guarantee you that even if this sermon falls flat, you're going to be blessed if you keep your Bible open. Yes. Because the word of God will not go avoid. Amen. Amen. And if you get bored, which I often do sometimes, you can skip over to the book of Romans or 1 Corinthians or Philippians and you can have your own sermon. Amen. But if you don't have your Bible open, you're not going to be able to have that experience. Amen. So my prayer this morning is that God will continue to move us to have spirit eyes, spirit ears. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray. If it's just my words, Father, we might as well go home now. But anoint the words that come from your word. Let them fall on fertile soil. And may we be changed. In Jesus, name. Amen. Amen. So, how do we saturate? How do we penetrate? First, view your present situation as God's opportunity. View your present situation as God's opportunity. Listen to this. Uh, it, it, it verse uh, the second, third, and fourth verses of chapter eight say this: At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. I love verse 4, though. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. You see, folks, Mount Calvary, the church, early church was in trouble. Persecution and suffering was great. People were forced to leave the city that they loved, the homes that they grew up in, the jobs that provided their income in order to save their lives. Yeah. Now, they could have said, I, well, I was just a mistake. I don't believe in Jesus. But they were too in love with Jesus to betray him and deny him, so they scattered out everywhere. Yeah. Now, Calvary, have you been there? When life takes unexpected turns and you find yourself in places you never thought you'd be, a pink slip comes, a phone rings at 2 a.m., a doctor gives shocking news, a spouse walks out, a child disappoints, a friend betrays, a church lets you down. A bank account crumbles. You name it. I don't know about you, but I've been there. I've been at times and places where I go, Lord, where are you? Lord, did I make a mistake? Lord, is this the path that you want me to be on? Lord, this is hard. Lord, I, I, I need... So when we scatter out, it's here, listen to this, it is here in the midst of our pain, it's here in the midst of the places where we never thought we would be, that we need to let the glory of God shine in us so that the world can see it and it be magnified like a movie screen that our God is able. If you and I never had any of those roads, how could we ever relate to the other world? And more often than not, our testimony comes in the dark of the night. And our lives become a movie screen for the glory of God. About three years ago, about this time, three years ago, my dad had a massive stroke. And before he had had the stroke, uh, we didn't realize that there was dementia going on. And he had made some foolish decisions that affected my mom. The house that they had lived in for 40 years, he put it up for auction. And none of the family knew. 
He took the business that my mom worked in and, 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 and um, basically gave it away. So every day there was something new, and I was at my um, mom's house when my dad had the stroke. And to be honest, my mom had just had it. She says, I need a break. Can I come stay with you for the summer? Because no one believes me. Something believes me that something's not right with your father. But I need a break. So we had all our stuff packed in the car. And that night at about 1 o'clock in the morning, a doorbell rang. And, it, and you know how it is at night when that happens. It jars you. And my dad woke up, um, uh, and I went to the door, and at that moment, my dad, I realized that my dad was in the process of a massive stroke. He was taken to the hospital, and then later to a nursing home where he is today. At that one instance, his mind completely, when he knows who I am, but he lives in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. His side was paralyzed, so he was never able to get out of bed again. He, he, he lives mostly an invalid. And my mom, I remember at that point, basically said, is my life over? Everything's been taken from me. But I'll tell you. That my mom was able to magnify the glory of God to others in the midst of her pain. And now about five days a week, she spends her time in a nursing home. But praise God, she's magnifying the glory of Jesus with patience in that nursing home. When life takes us different turns... We have a choice. Do we magnify Jesus or do we, like Job's wife, say, curse God and die? Sometimes we go into places that we did not expect to go. In her book, The Hiding Place, Corey Tin Boom tells of a time she discovered that God was working even in the most horrible circumstances. Corey and her sister Betsy were imprisoned in a concentration camp of the Nazis because they had harbored uh, Jews in their home. And the prison conditions were basically unbearable, but there was one barracks that was the worst of them all, and that's where Corey and Betsy were, <laughs> Barrack 28. Yes. Corey was horrified by the fact that their reeking straw bed platform yes. Swarmed with fleas. How could they live in such a place? But it was Betsy, Corey's sister, who discovered the answer. In Thessalonians, she said, Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. That's it, Corey. That's the answer. Give thanks in all circumstances. That's what we can do. We can start right now and thank God for every single thing in Barrack 28. Corey said, I stared at her then around at the dark, foul-smelling room. She said they began to thank God together. They thanked God they had a Bible. They thanked God for the horrible crowds of prisoners because more people could hear God's word. They thanked God that they were together. And then Betsy had the audacity to say, now, Corey, we need to thank God for the fleas. <laughs> the fleas, Corey said, that's too much. Betsy, there's no way even God can make me grateful for a flea. <laughs> Betsy quoted, give thanks in all circumstances. Corey didn't say in only pleasant circumstances. Fleas are a part of this place where God has put us. And Corey said that her and Betsy stood between the tiers of bunk beds and gave thanks for the fleas. But she said, this time I was sure Betsy was wrong. But she said, it turned out that Betsy was not wrong. The fleas were a nuisance, but a blessing after all. 
The women were able to have Bible studies in the barracks with a great deal of freedom, never bothered by supervisors coming in and harassing them. They finally discovered that it was the fleas that kept the supervisors out. Through those fleas, God protected the women from abuse and harassment. Dozens of desperate women were free to hear the comforting, hope-giving word of God. Through the fleas, God protected the women from, women from much worse things and made sure that their deepest, truest needs were met. Church, we need to thank God for our fleas. It's hard. In the midst of the early church's suffering, what was their response? It says they were scattered and went everywhere preaching the word. When God takes you on different paths and different journeys, you've got to take the word with you. Yeah. And so this morning, if we're going to saturate and penetrate our own personal worlds with the gospel, then we've got to thank God for we got to thank him for the hardship and suffering. Thank him for the opportunity to magnify the name of Jesus. Yes. What do we do next? Chapter 8, verse 26, gives us a little bit of a glimpse of one man's response to the fleas. His name's Philip. Mm -hmm. You guys are like Philip, um, the deacons. He was a deacon. Mm -hmm. And all of chapter 8, uh, pretty much 6, 7, and 8, talking about deacons. They must be important. Right. But when the church was scattered, Philip came alive and the gospel was preached. So second, what do we, how do we saturate, penetrate? Second, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit's directions are specific. Yes. Expect the Holy Spirit to personally speak and direct. Right. You hear that? The Holy Spirit is specific. Expect the Holy Spirit to personally speak and direct. Look at what, in verse 26. Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Philip's basically told, You're going to shine. Oh, Lord, where do I go shine? The desert. The Lord, uh, the Lord told Philip, You're going to be my witness. Where? In the desert. You need to realize that many times when the Lord is leading us, it makes no sense. Amen. Amen. And, and, and I'm reminded of, uh, they don't, I don't see them that much anymore, but in Texas, uh, there was a group of ladies that liked to quilt. And they had a quilting club. And they let me be a part of it. And they had this Frame. I don't know if you did everything, but they would wind it down. They would put up the roof and they would wind it down. And they would sit around the quilt and they would begin to do their stitches and everything. And, and they would say, it's so easy, you can do it. And, and, and they would cheer me on as I would do my stitches. And then I would go to the restroom or something and I would look back and I would see these nice ladies taking my stitches out and doing their own stitches. <laughs> but there's something about a quilt is that when the quilt is up on its frame and you can only see the bottom of the quilt, you got stitches going this way, that way, this way. It makes no sense. In fact, you're looking at it going, this is the ugliest thing possible. <laughs> but what happens when that thing gets lowered and you begin to see the color and the beauty of the quilt? It makes sense. And so we are, who are human have to realize, church, that what it may not make sense to us, we may see stitches here, stitches there, stitches here. But one day, God is going to unfold that, and we're going to look at the beauty and all that makes sense, and we're going to say, praise God. Amen. So if we're going to saturate and penetrate, we need to realize that there will be times when the Spirit leads us in some places that don't make sense. Amen. Now, Calvary, you may be in that place right now where you're going, it makes no sense. Pastor Edwards was, was here for 21 years. He should have been here until he was 100. It makes no sense. And as he and his wife were praying, it made no sense. But God said, trust me. 
Not only the Spirit's leading make no sense at times, but they are personal and specific. Listen to what he says in verse 28, I believe. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. He's in the desert. There's a chariot. The Spirit says, you got shoes on, I want you to run and catch it. The Holy Spirit will be specific. A young man had just left his Wednesday, I just heard the story, a young man had left his Wednesday evening Bible study. He was sitting in his car and he said, Lord, we studied about how in prayer you speak and you direct. I promise you that I'll obey you. Will you speak to me? He's driving his car. All of a sudden he hears this loud voice in his head, buy a gallon of milk. He's like, man, am I crazy? He hears it again, buy a gallon of milk. He goes, well, I guess I can always use milk. And so he, he pulls into the store, buys a gallon of milk, and he's going, okay, Lord, what now? Uh -huh. He's driving his car, and the Lord says, stop and turn here. So he stops and turns here. It's about 9.30 at night, and all the lights, it's kind of a shady a little bit community. He's like, Lord, this doesn't make sense. The Lord says, pull in here. He pulls in there. The Lord said, I want you to go knock on that door and give that, those folks the milk. He says, okay. They're probably asleep. But I promised you I'd obey. He knocked on the door. He heard scurrying in the house. And they came to the door. And when the teenager boy saw that he had milk, he began to scream. And he went down the hall. And the man says, what happened? He gets his mother, and when she sees him holding the milk, tears stream down her eyes. She said, in her broken English, we have no money to buy milk for our baby. So I prayed and asked God to send an angel with some milk. Are you an angel? You, you see, church, when we are in tune to the Holy Spirit, God is going to open up doors beyond what we could ever imagine. It won't make sense, but I will tell you, He will be specific, He will be practical, and it's up to us to obey Him. Amen. And so when we scatter out, even in hard times, we need to look for those opportunities to be sensitive to the Lord, and then watch what He does. Are you with me? Yeah. All right. No one sleep yet? Okay, third point. We need to walk through the door when it opens. Not only do we, we need to know that the Holy Spirit is specific and personal and takes us into places that make no sense, but we've got to walk through the door. Look at what it says in verse 27. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charged Candace of all her money, her treasury, who had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning, and sitting in the chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. By, by coincidence, right? Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake that chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, you know, it would have been really terrible of Philip to say, Okay, Lord, I want you to make it clear. Show me where you are at work. The, 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 the chariot, he's been told to run the chariot. The man is reading Isaiah. The man asks him a question. The man says, come into my chariot. If Philip doesn't open, go, walk through that door, he's crazy. More often than not, God opens doors for us so clearly for us, and oftentimes we don't go through them because we are fearful, or we don't go through them because we don't think that they'll be interested, or we don't go through them because they think we'll think we're crazy. But ultimately, who do we want to please? And if we want to please the Lord, we're going to obey Him. And so when He makes it clear, and He opens the door, we'll walk through. I was walking around my house the other day, and 
uh, and I was around the VA hospital, which is near where I live, and and I was just having my own kind of my own prayer time, and God says, "You ready to put into pr uh, practice what you tell people?" I'm like, "Oh, what are you going to get me into now?" <laughs> and so I walked, and I saw the the, the the veterans that smoke, or and they're out all over the VA hospital, all around it. He said, I want you to talk to that man. And I talked to this man. His name's Rick. He was in rehab for cocaine. We talked a little bit and I prayed with him and told him that Jesus loves him. Now I had a choice. I could have kept on going, going, man, that, that'll think I'm crazy. Or I could obey him and walk through the door. Fourth, when the door opens, point them to Jesus. Point them to Jesus. The place in the scripture where he read was this. He was led as a sheep in the slaughter, and as a lamb before his shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who, would declare, who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? And then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture preached Jesus to him. We want to center on Jesus, not on other rabbit trails. Amen. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our Lord. Amen. Jesus is the way. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And if we got the way and all truth and all life, what other things should we talk about? Somehow, sharing about the Indians or the Browns, don't seem as significant about, as, as about sharing the way, the truth, the life. Yeah. When I was in Brazil, as a college student, I memorized scriptures in Portuguese, but I could not speak any other thing. In fact, I was in a restaurant. And I, and I was getting brave that, that man, I got a handle on this culture. And I got in a restaurant and I went to buy me a co Coke. And, and all of a sudden, you would have thought that all of a sudden I had stole something. And everybody's going in their language. And I'm getting all flustered. And I'm like, I, I no comprende, no comprende. Far in place, I don't know. And, I, and, and uh, finally they let me go. And I, um, I, I go to explain, uh, tell my teammates. And they say, well, did you pay a deposit for the bottle? And I said, no. But that's what they want. <laughs> and so I didn't have common day Portuguese. So all I could do was talk about Jesus. And I memorized John 3.16. Porque Deus é um mundo de tal maneira que dei o filho de Egito para que todo aquele que creia por essa mas tenha vida eterna. I still remember it. That's all I can speak. <laughs> They would say, well, I don't know. All I could do was point to Jesus. And I remember in one home, there was a situation and the translator had to go over here. And here was a couple that wanted to hear about Jesus. And I looked at them and I said, oh, Lord. How am I going to do this? If they ask, I, I can give them the scriptures, but if they ask questions, I'm sunk. And so I remember saying, Como su nome? And she said, I'm Marie. And I said, I'm Marie. Jesus Cristo, protezón. And I thought, wow, where did that come from? God knows a little Portuguese. <laughs> and what ended up happening is that it's just by Point keeping the, the script on Jesus, two, day, two weeks later, that family were in the baptismal pool because they accepted Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not what we know or we don't know, it's Jesus. Amen. And if you've been at church even at least one Sunday, you should be able to preach and teach Jesus. But hear this, when we're pointing them to Jesus, this is important, don't forget to draw the net. Yeah. Look what, what Philip did. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. 
What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water and baptized him. Mm-hmm. You know, when we're talking about Jesus, if you don't draw the net and say, do you want him? You've left the conversation half undone. It's like somebody coming in, in to you, and I, I bet you cook really good. I bet that's probably why these cars are trying to get in your house, but I bet. <laughs> and so let's say you've got your best specialty dish. And I come to your door, and you say, wow, I love to cook, and I've got it on the table, and it's great, and I can smell it, and the, and the, the fumes are just about to, to just make me um, just uh, get hungrier and hungrier. And you say, have a good day, and shut the door. <laughs> That's what we do when we introduce people to Jesus. And we don't say, do you want to receive him right now? Do you want to make him Lord of your life? Do you want to surrender everything to him? When you don't draw the net, you slam the door and you don't invite him to the feast. And so I want to tell you, when you're scattered out and when you talk to them about Jesus, you need to say to them, do you want him to? Don't be afraid of all the questions they might ask you because guess what? If a couple can be led to Jesus with me only knowing one verse of the Bible in Portuguese, and I know Jesus Christo, God can use you. Finally, when you presented Jesus, you move on. You don't get stuck there. What it filled you when they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. When I get to heaven, I want to ask Philip about this. This is better. This is like a um, one of them Star Trek things where you just kind of warp somewhere, you know. But Philip, he he, he comes out of the water and he goes, "Where am I?" You know, nobody had ever had to tell Philip that God was real after that point. You know that? Philip was found in Astus. Philip just said, "Okay." Didn't expect to be here. So what did he do? And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. You know what will happen? Sometimes I hate it when I visit churches and, 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 and maybe it was, uh, they'll look and say, man, remember when? Or when they have a testimony time like you had and they say, I got a testimony. 30 years ago, this is what Jesus did. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear what God's doing in your life now. Yeah. And so when you, when you walk through the door and you obey him, then you move on to the next door because there's more doors to hit. And so this morning, I, as, as we draw the, the service to a close, I want you to think about this. It's going to take saturation and penetration. Long, long is a day gone when we can put up a sign and say, y'all come. It works for maybe 8%. But I don't know about you, but in a school grade, when your child, grandchild comes home with eight on the test, I don't think you're happy. I want to go for 92. 92% that don't know Jesus. And so sometimes your life situations, your hardships bring you into different places. Use it to shine for the Lord. And maybe right now you're in a place like that. Maybe right now, uh, in just a minute, as the, as, the, as the deacons and ministers are here, maybe you need to say, will you pray for me? I know I should magnify the glory of the Lord, but you know what? I'm having a hard time thanking God for the fleas right now. And so right now, Lord, help me to thank for the fleas. Maybe you need to ask for prayer. Maybe you're here this morning. And you need to be reminded that the Holy Spirit is personal. 